it was a story that had to be told and, and I thought needed to be told to the young people of America. Although you never can tell a reader how to read, I was hoping that they would be inspired by these young people in Cuba that took on an enormous task and succeeded. Hi everybody, my name is Christopher kaufman Ilstrip, and I'm the Executive Director of Vermont Humanities. I'm here today with my neighbor from up the road, Katherine Patterson. Um, she's here for our fall conference, Democracy 2020. Sadly, we're here on Zoom instead of in her garden, but we're doing what we can to keep safe in this time of COVID. Um, I want to introduce Kath Catherine briefly. She's the author of more than 30 books, uh, including 17 novels for children and young people. Um, you undoubtedly know her because she has twice won the Newbery Medal for Bridge to Terabithia in 1978 and Jacob Have I Loved in 1981. And she has twice won the National Book Award for The Master Puppeteer in 1977 and The Great Gilly Hopkins in 1979. She is the Vice President of the National Children's Book and Literacy Alliance and is a member of the Board of Trustees for Vermont College of Fine Arts. She was the 2010-2011 National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Today, we're here to talk with Catherine about democracy and literacy, uh, specifically through the lens of the Cuban literacy campaign of 1961, which Catherine wrote about in her middle grade novel, My Brigadista Year, which came out in 2017. Catherine, can I start by just asking you to explain what the Cuban literacy campaign was all about? Can you set the context for us? Uh, Fidel Castro, uh, took power uh, after he, out, he and his uh, troops, <laughs> uh, ragged troops, uh, got rid of Batista, the dictator who'd been there for a number of years and who was supported by many governments, including our own. And uh, he addressed the UN in 1960, after he was less than a year in power, and he said, in one year, uh, Cuba is going to become a literate nation. Of course, everybody sort of hoo hawed at that. But he came back to Cuba and uh, he called for volunteers. He said, if you can read and write, then you need to teach someone else how to read and write. And he, uh, he got uh, 750,000 vol Cuban volunteers, more than half of them were women, and almost 200,000 of them were between the ages of 12 and 18. So uh, the, these young people, and some of them, of course, were not so young, uh, went out and left their comfortable homes in the cities and went into the mountains and the villages and the factories uh, to teach people how to read and write. But they were told that they were not to be arrogant about what they knew. They were to learn from the people they were teaching. They were to work alongside them uh, in the fields or in the factories or in the big sugar plantations or coffee plantations. Then at night, they were to teach literacy. Uh, at the end of the year, the UN observers at that time called Cuba, the first totally literate nation in the Western Hemisphere, and that includes our own. And even today, Cubans are 98-99% uh, literate, and I think the United States was 82% literate the last time I checked, and we hadn't changed that in 10 years. It's amazing. Those are amazing numbers. Can, you know, one of the things that I was surprised uh, at was how many of the Brigadistas were young people. Uh, can you talk a, a little bit more about who these people were and 
why did these young people volunteer for this? What motivated them? And, and why did their parents support them? It was a very exciting time for Cuba. They had been under Baptista for a long time and, and the um, morale was very high. And they wanted to make it a new nation. And Fidel said, if you're going to have a strong nation, you have to have a, a literate nation. And these young people truly believed that. And they, it was a great adventure. And they had uniforms and, and uh, uh, songs and, <laughs> and everything, uh, which was quite, of course, appealing to young people. But there was just such a wonderful spirit of camaraderie and, uh, and adventure. And of course, um, <laughs> almost everyone whose story I heard, their parents at first, when they were young women, particularly objected to their going. And uh, they had to be somehow persuaded that they would be safe and they would be contributors to this new nation. And as we find out, it wasn't particularly safe for, for many of the volunteers. Um, I'm wondering, Catherine, could you, could you read for us a passage from the book, uh, uh, from uh, chapter nine? She's gone, Laura, our heroine has gone to the mountains and uh, her students and the family she lives with uh, are beginning their lessons. That night, Luis, Veronica, and I sat at the kitchen table under our bright lantern and began the first lesson in the primer. Because Luis was so eager to learn how to write his name, I wrote both their names in large chalk letters on the piece of slate Veronica had put up for a blackboard. The first lesson, you may remember, was to learn the vowels, O, E, and A. I pointed out the A's in Santana and Veronica. And soon we will do the other vowels, I and U, which are in Luis, I promised. I didn't realize that one of the first lessons would be how to hold a pencil. Veronica watched me carefully as I wrote the initial letters, O, E, A, but Luis eagerly grabbed up his pencil and clutched it in his fist as though it were an ax poised to chop up his workbook. Today, I said, Veronica had to teach me how to light the stove so I wouldn't set the house on fire. Tonight, please let me show you the best way to hold a pencil so both the pencil and the workbook will survive your attack on the alphabet. Luis looked up, puzzled, but when he realized I was joking, he laughed and let go of his tight grip on the pencil. Then he allowed me to demonstrate a more gentle and effective method of wielding his new tool. Lessons were erased daily from the slate, but never their names which Luis always looked at longingly, night by night, until after he knew his vowels and consonants, indeed all the alphabet. I wrote his name in his workbook and suggested he practice copying it. Then came the night I erased his name from the slate and urged him to try his hand at writing it where I had written it two weeks before. The chalk was tight in his hand and his tongue peeked out the corner of his mouth as painstakingly he wrote for the first time his own name for others to see. At the final A, he let out something between a gasp and a laugh. You did it, I said. You wrote Luis Santana. I wrote my name, he said, and my wife and my teacher can both read it, right? My name. Luis Santana. Now everyone who can read will know that I am Luis Santana. Wait, let me get my camera. I fetched my Uncle Roberto's camera from my rucksack. Now stand there. No, don't hide your signature. Stand a little to your left so I can see both your smile and your name. I've taken many photos since, but none I treasure more. Got me crying already. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about it was, writing your own name was very important 
to these people. Because if you couldn't write your name, you had to sign everything with a thumbprint or an X. And that was humiliating. But to be able to write your own name, well, all of us, our names are very important to us. <laughs> I'm reading another book right now um, by another Vermont author, M.T. Anderson, um, The Astonishing Life of Octavian Nothing. Yeah, oh my. Um, <laughs> and, um, which is quite a book. Uh, but that same moment occurs um, for Octavian, who is a, an escaped slave, an enslaved person. And he, um, he is uh, joining uh, the British army um, in, in return for his promised freedom. And they tell him to make an X, but he signs his name because he knows how to read. Um, and that's quite a moment for the, the British soldier who signs him up to join the army. So, Catherine, why did you decide to write about the campaign almost 50 years after it occurred? What relevance did you see in this story for young people or for adults today? Well, I know there's more than one reason, but one reason that occurred to me is that I didn't know anything really good about Fidel Castro. And when I discovered that Cuba was more literate than the United States because of him, it has a better medical system before him because of him. Um, I thought, why is it that we, when we admire someone, we want them to be perfect. And when we dislike someone, we refuse to see any good in them. And I think that's one reason we're having so much trouble in our country right now, because it's very hard for us to look at people that, whose ideas we oppose and see in them the good that's there. Um, the other thing was, it's a remarkable story that you could turn a company, a, a country from a large percentage of illiterate people to a whole literate population in one year through the work of volunteers. I mean, that is an amazing story. And it's a story that I kept asking people in this country, had you heard this story? And very few people had. I thought it was a story that had to be told. Well, you know, here at Vermont Humanities, we, we strongly support the goals of programs like the Cuban Literacy Campaign. And I found the book very inspiring. Um, and indeed, you know, we believe and have believed since the beginning of Vermont Humanities that universal literacy is a common good in society that we should all strive for. That's one of the things that our founder, Victor Swenson, said in the very beginning of this organization. You know, our conference this year is about democracy, but the Cuban revolution did not set up a democratic society for the people of Cuba. You talked about that a little bit, but nevertheless, Fidel felt very strongly that everyone in Cuba needed to know how to read to support Cuban society. Can you talk a little bit more about the contradictions that are inherent in that goal in the context of the history of Cuba? Well, I find it very interesting because, um, we know from our own history, uh, and I come, you know, I'm, I, I'm come from a whole long line of Southerners, uh, that slave owners and Southerners do not want African American slaves to learn how to read. And you know, in the wonderful uh, autobiography of Fred, Frederick Douglass, his mistress is secretly teaching him to read, and his master finds out about it and explodes in anger. He says, you teach him to read, you'll never be satisfied to be a slave. And he said, even though it ended his lessons with his mistress, he learned a most valuable lesson, that reading was going to be his pathway to freedom. Mm. Uh, and I think Castro said you couldn't have a strong nation without a literate population. Now, of course, there are people who read things that Castro would not approve of. <laughs> uh, there, they have a serious shortage of paper, and because of our embargo, but, so they can't print as many books as they want to. You know, people I've met had read Martin Luther King. They'd read a lot of books uh, that you wouldn't think they would have had access to in a dictatorship. But once you read, your mind is free. <laughs> 
he took a risk uh, <laughs> that Batista certainly hadn't taken, uh, and which most dictators uh, will not take. So I just find that an interesting contradiction in his mm-hmm. in his character. Maybe he didn't set out to be a dictator. Maybe he set out to be the savior of the Cuban nation, and then fear turned him into a dictator uh, because too much of the world was against him, especially his big neighbor to the north. I'd like to ask you if you could to read another section from the book. Um, In this section, one of the main characters is learning about what he needs to do to pass his literacy test. It's from chapter 10. Yeah, so this is an older couple that have joined the, the lessons, um, their neighbors. And at first um, they didn't join, but now they've joined. And uh, the, the old man uh, is trying to learn how to write his name, of course. Teaching Joaquin how to write his name became something of a challenge. He looked at what I had written on the slate and said, that's not my name. Yes, it is, I said. J-O-A-Q-U-I-N. That is the way to spell Joaquin. No, he protested. It should be J-O-A-C-I-N. You taught us kake kikoku. It should be like ki. Like you taught us. No, Joaquin, I'm sorry. I didn't teach you that. I told you it's ka ko ku, but the C before I and E is pronounced like a S sound. C I is pronounced C. You would want to pronounce Joaquin, Joaquin, would you? Of course not. So the proper spelling of your name is J-O-A-Q-U-I-N. Why? I don't know why, I said. I didn't decide it. Maybe somebody long ago in Spain decided on this funny way to write it. It's strange, but that's the way it is. And if you want someone to look at what you've written and write and you read and read Joaquin, this is the way you will have to spell it. He shook his head. Makes no sense, he grumbled. No, it doesn't, and I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do about it. It's just the way it is. When I write my letter, I will tell Fidel it is wrong and tell him to change it. We won our freedom from Spain many years ago. Those stupid imperialists have no right to tell us how to write our own names. On Sunday, when I read this story aloud from my diary, All my friends laughed with delight. He's perfectly right, Lydian said. You must encourage Joaquin to write Fidel and tell him so. (laughs) Writing a letter to Fidel was not a joke. It was part of the final exam for those who had completed the primer. There were three tests. The first test required students to write their full names and addresses. Then they were required to read and write six simple words, three simple sentences, and a short paragraph. For the intermediate test, the words and sentences to be read were harder. The final test consisted of a paragraph with quite difficult words. In English, it went something like, the revolutionary government wants to turn Cuba into an industrialized society. Many industries will be started. Many people will have jobs. There will be no more unemployment. After the paragraph was read, the student was required to write out answers to several questions related to the paragraph. Then he or she had to turn the paper over and write out the paragraph as the teacher dictated it. Finally, the student was to write a letter to Dr. Fidel Castro. When our leader announced the literacy campaign, He said he wanted every student who completed the primer to write him a letter. So the letter became part of the final test. It must have been terrifying for people (laughs) when they were trying to pass that test to know that they were writing a letter to the leader of the country. And they probably felt like he was going to read their letter, every single one of them. 
Do, do you think? I don't know if he did or not. I certainly thought he did. And those uh -huh. letters were preserved there in a museum in, in Havana. Uh -huh. Do you think that, that Fidel did read the letters? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, what do you, what, Catherine, what do you think Fidel hoped to gain from declaring victory over illiteracy? Because they really, they, they thought about it as being a battle, right? That they were conquering illiteracy. Yes. What, what yeah. did he hope to gain from that? Well, certainly respect for himself and for his regime, don't you think? Mm -hmm. uh, and also the loyalty of his people. They had given, he had given them this great gift of learning how to read. Uh, and so I, I would imagine that was a huge boost to the morale of the country. You, you open the book with an epigram from the poet Jose Marti. It says, it is the duty of man to raise up man. When, when you look at the history of the Latin American revolutions in Cuba, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and other places, um, you can see that art and culture was very important to the leaders of the revolutions, but also to the common people in those places. And you can certainly see that in your book where singing and dancing, painting and poetry, especially the poetry of Jose Marti, uh, were very important themes. Why is that? What, what is it about art and in particular Cuba and, and that poet, Jose Marti, that was so important to this group of revolutionaries? Well, Marti was the first great revolutionary of Cuba. I mean, the statue to him, this enormous building, which is the, his monument, uh, is where uh, Fidel and the current leader gather when they gathered the thousands of people who've come to hear them speak. It's in front of that statue. Uh, so he, he's, uh, as I say somewhere in the book, he's not only uh, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, uh, he's also their great poet and, and literary artist. Why is it that our country doesn't value <laughs> the arts? I think that's the big question yeah. because most countries do. And certainly in Latin America, uh, the arts are, are honored and loved and the, and the artist as well. Uh, but our, you know, you go to our cities, the statues are the war heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, you have to look really hard to see a statue of a poet. I'm trying to e think Even what, in Vermont. Even, even in Vermont. <laughs> I mean, you would think in Vermont we would have we would have statues to Robert Frost, you uh, at the very least. At the very um, least. But but I um, no, there are, there aren't any. In Barry, we have statues of Robert Burns because uh, the Scots got them got the money together and and mm -hmm. paid the Italian sculptors to to uh, the statue of Bobby Burns, right. which is a gorgeous statue. So yeah. we do have Bobby Burns, who's right. not a Vermont artist, but <laughs> the saint of the Scot. Well, and Barry does celebrate Robert Burns Day because that statue is there, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, one of the, the, the many interesting things about the book is that it, it, complicates, it complicates the narrative, the accepted US narrative about Cuba, right? Yeah. So John F. Kennedy makes a very, brief appearance in the book when the characters talk about the Bay of Pigs invasion uh, that attempted to overthrow Castro and it happened during the time of the literacy campaign. The invasion was not successful, uh, but the counter-revolutionaries that they supported up in the mountains are really the villains of the story. Yeah. Um, and they're disrupting the literacy campaign with violence. A, a young brigadista, uh, Manuel Espunce, was killed um, and that's talked about in the story. And I know there's statues to him um, in Cuba um, today that he's uh, considered a martyr of the revolution. Why was it important to you to show the violence that the United States encouraged and inspired against the brigadistas? Well, it's part of the story. It's not part of the story we like because it doesn't make us look so good. From the, the uh, Cuban point of view, it was pretty important mm -hmm. that 
you know, if Kennedy had welcomed the revolution, I think our whole history with Cuba would be quite different instead of opposing it. Because by opposing it, he is de facto supporting Batista and his terrible reign, which was all tied up with the mafia situation where the American mafia was part owner of the casinos and, and uh, Batista was raking off profits from the casinos because uh, he was hand in love with the American mafia. Um, so why, why did we embrace Batista instead of Castro? Is, were we that afraid of communism? in this little island to our south. I want to go on and talk a little bit about what it was like for you um, to write this book. Um, so after the book came out, you were nominated for, and you won, the 2018 International Latino Book Award for Best Fictional Youth Chapter Book. Um, and as you pointed out to me, your ethnicity on the awards website is listed as Caucasian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, there has of late, you may have noticed, been a fair amount of discussion in the literary world about who is allowed to write which stories. And very often people are taking the position that white writers should avoid telling stories about people of color. Many other people respectfully disagree and believe that being able to step into the shoes of others is the very definition of a good writer. Clearly, the panel at the International Latino Book Awards felt that you wrote a great book. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about what your thought process was like when you were considering writing this book? Well, I really had to think about it because I'm not Hispanic <laughs> at all. I, I mean, when I did my DNA, there just wasn't any there. But uh, it was a story that had to be told. And, and I thought needed to be told to the young people of America. Young people will rise to the occasion. As, and that wonderful thing I'll never forget when John Lewis was at, at the Flynn and somebody said, aren't you pessimistic? And he said, how can I be pessimistic when I see what young people are doing today? And when I wrote the book, there wasn't this great movement of young people on behalf of the environment or racial justice. Uh, and now there is, and that, that is a, a, a wonderful, wonderful thing to see young people and, and against crazy gun situation we have in this country. So we, we really have three of our largest problems in this country. It's the young people who are standing up and saying no more. And uh, that's thrilling to me. That wasn't happening when I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. And I think in a way, uh, although you never can tell a reader how to read, I was hoping that they would be inspired by these young people in Cuba that took on an enormous task and succeeded. So I didn't have any right to write the book. And when I came back from Cuba, I was telling my friends about my trip and, and about how inspired I was by the people that I, uh, I was close to there. And one of my friends said, well, you, you need to write about it. And it, it just seemed to be a first person book, which I don't usually write. So not only did I write about uh, a country and a people that I'm not a part of, but I wrote it in first person. <laughs> so there you are. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, I lived in Japan, I lived in China, and I've written about both of those countries, but once the hue and cry went up that we had no right to write about cultures that were not our own, even though I had spoken both of those languages, lived in both of those places, I was sort of scared off about ever writing about them again. Uh, but um, there I did, I wrote about Cuba. <laughs> so, but I don't want to be confined to writing about 87 year old ladies who live in old folks' homes on the hills above right. my ear. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that one step further. I'm looking at some data from the 
Cooperative Children's Book Center that's at the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Yeah. And they did do research every year on diversity in children's books. Uh, and this is the data from 2018 that, that uh, and this is about who's the heroine or the hero in, in, a, in a particular set of children's books. So in 2018, they found that about 50% of the children's books published that year were about white children. Um, only about 10% were about African-American children, 7% about Asian Pacific Islanders, only 5% Latinx, um, and only 1% American Indians. And the real kicker here is that 27% of the books published uh, in 2018 had animals as their <laughs> heroes or heroines, um, second only to white children. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, one of the, the, you know, it's great that, that My Brigadista Year does have a young Latina heroine, um, is about Cuba. Um, are there things that writers should be doing, uh, particularly white writers? Do they have a particular responsibility for um, talking about racism in the publishing industry or talking about whose stories get told? What do we, what do, we do to help increase representation so that we are hearing, hearing more stories like this one? Well, I think um, one thing we need to do is have more editors who are not all white. Uh, in the children's book world, almost every editor I know is a, a white female. So there's not a lot of diversity in publishing is part of the problem. Uh, the houses that have, have gotten um, African-American editors are the ones who are publishing the books written by African-Americans because those editors have made an effort to go out and find African-American writers. I'd like to, I'm going to loop back around to Vermont and then we're going to wrap it up in, in just a couple more minutes. Um, but, you know, I mentioned to you when we were talking last week that my graduate study was in international development, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a, a field that usually leads to jobs and, and organizations doing literacy work or hunger work, places like Oxfam or USAID or the World Bank, often in countries like Cuba. Uh, but instead, I'm working on literacy here in Vermont. Um, I don't personally tend to see much daylight between community development work that happens in Latin America or Africa and community development work that happens here in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how the work of Vermont Adult Learning informed and inspired your interest in the Cuban literacy campaign? Because I know that's a piece of the story that maybe people don't that, know. That's a piece of the story. It is indeed. Um, when I first, I came to Vermont in 1986, and um, very early on, um, I got involved in adult learning um, uh, center in, in Barrie. I didn't tutor, but I, I, I spoke, I read, one of my early speeches in Vermont was to a wonderful gathering of, of new adult later, learners from all over the state. Uh, and uh, I was terrified because I was, the person who invited me um, had heard me speak and sort of hinted that it couldn't be my usual kind of having every word written out in, in a notebook. And I thought, why well, make a speech without a manuscript in front of me? I just, that's not the way I work. And I, I was really terrified. But it was, a, it was just a wonderful occasion. And so uh, I, I, I got to be friends with these folks. And Mary Leahy was um, very prominent in the uh, work at that time. I think she was head of the whole shebang. And Mary and I got to be friends. And it was through Mary that I first heard about the uh, Cuban Literacy Project because we were at the state, uh, state House event and catching up with each other. And I said, oh, Mary, I'm going to Cuba in a few weeks. And she said, oh, I'm so jealous. She said, Pat gets to go there all the time. And 
By the way, our senator is a hero to all my friends in Cuba because he has worked so hard for better relationships with Cuba. And uh, anyhow, he, he said, I, I, you know, when I began working at, uh, in, in Vermont, about adult education, I tried to take ideas from the human, from the Cuban literacy campaign of 1961. And I thought, I'm going to Cuba and I don't know anything about Cuban literacy campaign of 1961. So I said, well, well I never heard of it. Well, tell me about it. And she said, well, you know, Jonathan Coastal wrote this book about it. And she headed me in that direction. And then I began reading about it. And, uh, I had this friend in Cuba that I kept saying to my Guatemalan friend, why isn't the media in jail? Because she was so outspoken and so, uh, such a powerful woman. And, <laughs> and when I wrote my speech for this conference I was going to give when I went to Cuba, uh, the, uh, Isabel, who was translating for me, she said, you know, uh, Amelia was a brigadista, didn't you? Oh, well, that explains it. I hadn't known my f closest friend in Cuba was a brigadista. But once I, I knew the story of those young women who went out and became really powerful women through that year's experience, I thought, well, that certainly explains Amelia now. She was a brigadista. The book is dedicated, of course, to, to Amelia and Brigadista. And I got a wonderful letter from, from Amelia, which made me feel that it was okay that I'd written a book, because she said that she didn't, hadn't believed that anyone who wasn't there would have known what it was like. Yeah. I can imagine that those young people, many of them probably became leaders in their communities for okay. decades. Absolutely. They absolutely did. Uh -huh. um, you know, I think that that's probably a, a fairly good place to stop. It's been a delight to spend this time with you. Can we close out our time together with one more passage from the book, from chapter 17? It's right up close to the end, but I don't think it's too much of a spoiler. I'd love to read it. Thank you. If you really want to see Laura smile, her beautiful smile, Luis said to Joaquin and Dunia, you have to pass your final exam and write your letter to Fidel before she leaves. We were slated to leave on December 20th. It was now the second week of December. Dunia was almost ready, but she would insist on repeating a lesson even when I felt sure she was ready to move on. She sensed that I was losing patience with her. I didn't mean to, but I so needed her to pass, and I was sure she could if you tried hard enough. One night when Joaquin and Luis were noisily at work, she whispered in my ear, I must wait. Old men, they feel the loss of their machismo. Don't you see? I could only sigh and nod. So I cheered heartily when on December 15th, Luis declared that Joaquin was at last ready to take his final exam. The old man passed, not brilliantly like his daughter-in-law or almost perfectly like his son, but he passed and was set to work writing the long awaited letter to our country's leader. December 15, 1961, Dr. Fidel Castro, city of Havana, Comrade Fidel, I can read and write even the big words and the squiggles on the end. But why must I write my name like the old Spanish oppressors? We won independence. We won the revolution. We have won the war against illiteracy. Now we must free our spelling. Your comrade, Joaquin Acosta. That's a wonderful letter, Joaquin, I said. I'll write a better one next year when I know more big words, he said. That will surprise him, won't it? I'm sure it will, I said, eager to get back to my final student. Dunia waited discreet three days before she agreed to try her exam. We never told anyone that her grade was higher than her husband's. Mm -hmm.
And I'm crying again. <laughs> it's it's such a, a magical moment, I think, for for anyone, right? Whether whether you're five or fifty, um, to have that moment when you really feel like you can do it. Yes. That you that you are a literate person and what that does for you as a human um, is is just um, remarkable. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for being with us in conversation. Um, I hope that everyone will go to their local bookstore and pick up my Brigadista year or take it out of your library. Many of the libraries are doing curbside pickup. Um, and Catherine, of course, has 30 other books if you want to check out some of those. So uh, thanks for being with us, and, um, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it.